thank you very much, Dr. Gas. That was absolutely fascinating. From the very first word to the last one, oh, I could uh, I could listen to that all night. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, if if you don't mind, uh, we we'll take a few oh, please, yes. questions. Yes. So, if anybody would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. And please, in this forum, you don't have to be gentle with me. You can. You know, you, I'm very happy to have. You know, there are the obvious questions about the kind of, you know, religion in this area, which I think do need to be addressed. Yeah. Well, you know, I, you mentioned 11,000 years was exposed. Yes. I don't know how that's possible when the Bible says the world is only 6,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you so much for uh, this presentation. It's really many things that I never knew, actually. I, I, I thought that Christianity knows uh, being brought to, by missionaries to Africa, so this is like a new thing for me and for, for thought. But when it comes to Islam, uh, yes. as being from Morocco myself, yes. um, Ibn Khaldun, the great yes. sociologist, yes. Berber sociologist, the one that said when it become Arabized, it become destroyed. He actually put the account of how Islam went to from Egypt and went to yes. Morocco, which where he said Morocco actually is the name, its name is the West in reference to Saudi Arabia as being the East. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the history of Islam, as we went, and the wars that been, for example, a killing of people, yes. thousands and thousands of people, till um, Ibn Khaldun, for example, say in, in, in Morocco, he killed 16,000 people, and then they went back at least, I think, three or four times to establish Islam as a religion mm -hmm. in, Morocco, uh, in, in Morocco and North Africa in general. Mm -hmm. The problem is, that not just um, that being introduced, but I think that it being um, one colonial, first of all, and imperialistic, because people had their allegiance to something in Mecca or something in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And even now, after 12 centuries of the Moroccan kingdom that we had, we still follow an Arabian guy who lived in Mecca as our well, source. Well, one of the things, I, I agree with you to a large extent, but one of the things, particularly in, um, in Lalabella, that the idea was that, he, that they were trying to, they, I mean, if anywhere has an argument outside of Jerusalem to claim to be the center of the Christian religion, it, you, know, the, you know, I think that they would say that they had the longest tradition. And um, what they were trying to, established was a new center so they didn't have to go on pilgrimage that they could it could be there it could be it could be an african solution to their spiritual needs and then the in terms of of of, of, of timbuktu i agree that mansa musa went on pilgrimage to um to to, to, to mecca um but what he was but what was, I think was particularly interesting about him was that he was more like um, one of the Medicis in which he embraced the religion but he saw it as being an opportunity for trade, for, um, for creating a cosmopolitan um, but stable um, region and one of the ways in which that is very evident is that all of these buildings when, even when they're being prepared like this, the, the blessing that they give them isn't an Islamic one, it's not a Muslim one. They break eggs, they will sacrifice chicken. The, 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 the kind of practices that they use on the mosques when they are, every year they repair them, predate Islam. What they, are, I think, are pretty aggressively trying to say is that this is ours. This is ours, very, very powerfully, very powerfully. And that's something that you have to respect. And that most of the people that I worked with who were Muslim, manifestly Muslim, that it was a particular kind of practice that was seen to me to be very marvelous. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah.
Okay. You promised you were going to give me a nice question. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was uh, equally as shocked that it was Africans wiping out their own history. Yes. Which is one of the saddest. I mean, next to the destruction there. Doing the Middle East. Yes. You know, I mean, uh, it breaks my heart. It's just like Nuremberg. Yeah. What, what I'm not, as a student of modern history, yes. how do I fit the, the history of Africa into, how do I bridge it into the way we see the modern world right now? Um. I mean, you've got a lot of us that have said that's given us a lot of.
I wanted to ask on exactly that topic. So you've got these incredible sites. Um, yes. And I mean, I know you've said you know, places like the Bobby Roods and Bobby Roods have yes. done some work yes. in those places. But how well do you feel that we're managing to archive and protect and commemorate these places? I mean, yes. are we achieving it? Or do you think we're falling deeply short? Are a lot of them wasting away and not getting to Time. All, all, of, all of the above. I mean, we're we're falling desperately short. Average. When Timbuktu, when it was attacked, that there are about what seven hundred thousand documents in the Timbuktu collections. Um, about four thousand were destroyed, but the vast bulk was smuggled to Bamako, um, and. A huge amount of that has now been digitized. Um, almost all of it has actually been conserved um, in ways that it hadn't been previously. There has been investment. And across the continent, there is now more resource going into these things than there ever has been. But nevertheless, there are sites, as I said, that would absolutely astound you if they were anywhere else that they would just, you know, know. And I, I can remember making a film in Morocco. We were standing by an 11th century site and we had to stop filming because there was a man with um, um, a digger, just sort of, you know, he was just sort of gouging up the earth. And like, you could see kind of fragments of kind of pottery and kind of masonry flying up. No, like these things have been in the ground for a thousand years and this guy just doing kind of, un it's the sort of thing that if it was in Europe, the man would have been arrested. But he was doing it with sanction, with municipal sanction. That, so what I'm saying is a mix of the two, that there is so much out there, but at the same time it is so fragile. You. You're on. Islam as a single constituent. And what 
these kind of crazy ants dean people are trying to do is to turn that on its head so that it actually is that Islam is the underpinning thing. So the beauty of it is, is that by having um, a state which is founded around those narratives is that they are negotiable, that they are things that you can legislate with. Because you can't legislate with religion because, you know, I'm holding a Quran or a Bible, it's in here, that's it. You know, whereas what they actually kind of base, what they actually base their kind of their, their culture on is something which predates that, which is um, around the idea of of shared narrative, of multiple people sharing the narrative. And I think that is something which hopefully will give a kind of a model of hope, a kind of lib liberalism, a sense that there are multiple voices and, and there and there is a kind of a, a kind of dialogue between um, peoples. And uh, you have to compromise if you want to, if you, if you want to stand a chance. Okay. Um, yeah. Me? Yep. Um, I just want to say thanks first to Gus for that. That was really enlightening. Oh, I, don't, I don't know much about this. That was brilliant. And my son got a brilliant history lesson, which he didn't get at school. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> keep worried a little, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, it's funny you should mention about Arabs because I'm part Arab and we have problems with that as well, finding an identity that is not Islamic. Yes. <laughs> so that's quite strange that you mentioned it. I mean, I named my daughter Kinda, which is the, the tribe of Kinda, were a pre Islamic tribe. And the women of Kinda danced when the Prophet Muhammad died um, because he obviously brought a patriarchy. Mm -hmm. So we, yeah, also, I mean, my Arab part is Muslim, but it's much more than Muslims. You know, there's so many different identities in the Arab world, the so-called Arab world, if you call it that, really. So it's not... Pure. But there is, but when people go on things like Hajj, and they, that you then see, and you, there are people brought from right across the Arab world into a very kind of condensed, concentrated area. It's then that you see that there are very kind of profound differences, cultural differences, and you begin to then realize that it's almost synthetic, the underpinning bit that people kind of, you know, the Islamic bit. The actual thing that binds those people is the narrative which is around their kind of ethnic identity. And they're kind of, you know, it may, I think it, I actually think that <laughs> particularly for people in this area, that they feel they feel very African, and I imagine when they actually kind of go on pilgrimage, that they probably feel even more African in the context. Of <laughs> Somehow, our um, 
are, we see our brief as being bigger than just telling a British story, that somehow that we are neutral, we are international. We, and, and yet if you go and you stand in the centre of the Great Court of the British Museum, and you'll see all the continent, all the different kind of cultures, the civilizations mapped out in every direction. You'll have Assyria, and you can see the Chinese and the Japanese, and all these different types of civilization, all posed as peers over different periods, different parts of the world, but equal and different. But the one that doesn't fit and is therefore in the basement is, is different. <laughs> and, you know, for me, I go and visit places like that with my daughter, and I want her to feel, you know, there's enough racism already, but I want her to feel that <laughs> she can stand shoulder to shoulder with anyone, that no one has a right to say, like Hegel, you don't have history, you are therefore in inferior. That without the story, you don't. Have, without a past, you don't have a future. And I think that organisations like that are actually duty bound to tell the story with a degree of respect. And what I see my job out as is that there is an embarrassment, an embarrassment of evidence that completely refutes the idea of Africa in any way, either not having, or of being primitive or anything like that. All of those sorts of labels that have been put on us. And fine, let's invest in our future. It's absolutely critical. But that doesn't mean that we can't also simultaneously invest in our past. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, you are a typical example of someone who doesn't, you're lost in the world of the sea of every other group of people. Where do you come from? Who are you? I'm Kwame Azari. No, no, who are you? Is, you're not you, one person doesn't make a group of people. There's not many communities. Okay, you need to listen. <laughs> <laughs> Chinese, India, wherever they come from, they have an idea, they have something where they, where they know where they're from, they have something to hold on to, they know their history, know your history, the foundation of your past, which of course identify with your future and your present. I think I've you need to listen first of all, young man, because you really need to fuck. <laughs> I don't really understand what you're saying. I just want to say one thing. I just want to say one thing. Can I just say something? Can I just say something? In my family, with my grown children, my grand, we discuss things with passion. We don't see it as an argument, we don't see it as expressing ourselves. So we need to be careful when we talk with someone to be with passion to say, I'm just being passionate, not angry. Okay. okay. So, um, no, 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 you're not just being what I'm doing. So anyway, if you do not understand your place, as, as it is, a group of what we call black people, which should be African and African descent, we are lost in the rest of the, among everybody else. No, we don't know, we don't have a place in this world. Okay? We come so for us to go, everyone else knows their history. We have a British history, China, everyone has their own history. We also need to embrace our history to give us something to touch us back to that we had before we contributed to, to the world. To the because if we have a country to world, we are what are we? We just hand us on. Yeah. And we cannot afford to be we've got a history, <coughs> we need to actually learn it and teach our But can I just say can I just say that in the spirit of Mansa Musa and Priscilla <laughs> that, that there are many different ways of thinking about things and I do think, you know, that it's important that we embrace the future. And the great thing is, is that the great thing, I, I opened um, an exhibition at the um, British Library, um, and it's about our um, inter West African intellectual tradition. It's the first ever exhibition that they put on. At the and, and in my opening talk, the thing that I was trying to, to emphasize is the idea that the sorts of traditions that we see here 
that in different manifestations, they're still very much part of who we are, that we are still kind of, you know, we are still kind of um, incredibly creative, ingenious people, but the manifestations of those things will be utterly different. And what I was trying to tell people in that um, talk was that we need to look for the next generation of people who are going to change people's minds about Africa as well. But it needs to be a dual thing in which we look back, we respect the past, but we also have the strength and the ambition to grab onto the future and to change it, and to change the attitudes of people that would deny us that chance. And, and I think, you know, in that sense, your two views come together. Okay, sorry, sorry. This way. <laughs> Are there questions for me or is it a bad thing? First of all, um, I thank the lady and the uh, gentleman over there. Yes. Because I truly do feel, as he feels, that I could not fit anywhere. Um, so I think you, you were addressing the problem I have, so thank you for that. Um, for a person who came from an African background, yes. who grew up in an Arabic culture... Um, could, could you tell me, what, would you mind telling me what it was? Yes, that's a question. Yeah. Um, so a person with a mixture of cultures and background, but being originally from Africa, it was difficult to find where you fit. So my question, when you mentioned how philosophers and uh, what was their opinion about the culture, African yes. culture, I wanted to um, ask you, do we know what is the influence of culture, African culture on the um, Greek culture? Because you know that later actually mm -hmm. seek enlightenment from the Africans. Yeah. So instead of uh, perhaps coming to uh, Hegel and the Roman part, okay, yeah. came yeah. later on, actually Africans have influenced oh, yeah. the earlier civilizations. Yeah. So if you show that actually we started it, you know. Yeah. Well that's nice. Yeah. That's, yeah. 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 that's what the whole thing is about. Yeah. No, but I agree with you. That I, I agree with you. What I was trying to do was oh, just to... Sorry, the second part of the okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a great memory, so I'm probably going to have trouble with it, navigating my way back through this, but carry on. I'll keep a second short, so I don't know if people are trying to put. What can people like myself do to help people Academics who are rewriting this history, and one of the ways in which we could support them is by buying their books and reading them, and reading them to our children. And um, in part, they are helping us to to bridge that gap so that we know more about that early history. What I'm trying, what I was trying to address was the idea that for most of us, our learning is based on, it is based on enlightenment tradition. The reason, if you go into the British Museum, the reason they have an enlightenment gallery is because that is the fundamental underpinning of Western civilization. And so that's the reason why Africa is in basin, because it can't fit. So what I, I'm trying to say is, it's important that you understand the perspective of people like Hegel and Locke and and all of those, those, those philosophers, because we have to address that first. We have to deconstruct that first to understand where the prejudice comes from. And then we need to build our own version, <coughs> our own history. And that is, leads back to your other question. That's why I think they're two beautifully posed questions which relate one to the other. Can I just say at this point that for those people who are looking for more information that uh, Dr. Gus actually has a book 
out. And uh, that book will be one of the prizes in our raffle. <laughs> raffle tickets, see David at the back. Okay, the next person is this lady here. sometimes at risk of death. And the reason why is because narrative is, without it, you're absolutely lost. It's a thing that people do. It does you the most psychological damage to cut away someone's sense of where they came from, of their history. And it doesn't matter whether you choose to open a book, but you know you go into a library, you smell that smell, you look down the line, of in, a li in, a, in any library stack, and you see the spines of those books, and you think, those are people who are right, and you know it's dedicated to telling someone else's story, or telling a different perspective about your story, that doesn't make you feel proud. proud. But what we need to do is to rewrite those stories, rewrite those stories for our children, just to feel at ease. They may never read them, but they will be able to walk down the street with their head held high, knowing that I have the underpinnings that give me the confidence. Okay, um, it's getting a bit uh, late in Dr. Gus's time. A fantastic job. Yeah, thank you. All right, so um, we're going to. Do you already have a question? We're going to take care of you. Well, there's a few yeah. people who are very happy to. Two more, yeah. Alright, alright. So, Lee. Thank you. So, Lee. I'm sorry. 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 I'm sor
we have to go back 150,000 years. Um, when we're talking about origins, we're talking about origins of all forms of civilization. That's that science, maths, art, literature, everything you can you know, imagine. We find the evidence in Africa. Um, so I was hoping to know if you were going to actually include that in your presentation because the way that it came across to someone who has educated themselves in their history, it came across as the, the reason I heard, I mean, I understand you added that at the end about the um, uh, Africans in Mali holding on to uh, uh, their own tradition and that it is on, sets on top of it. However, uh, you didn't elaborate on how the actual original tradition was. Um, we started from Timbuktu, mm. and that's only half of the story. Yes. Sat San Kore is the original uh, one that came before Islam and came before all of the invasion. Mm. So, um, it's, it's just the waiting of it's just the waiting of my time. What I'm very interested in illustrating, demonstrating, is that particularly if you live in the West and living in London and we are so spoiled in terms of our cultural life. You could go to 10 different things every day, all year round. But as someone of African descent, I don't often feel that, that I am well reflected in the cultural offer, particularly the cultural offer that is, um, that is um, given government support. And so, and, and so what I was trying to do is to think about what is the authorised story of Africa? Where did it come from? Why is it that there are those kinds of attitudes? And I wanted to go in on the ground floor and the, 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 the bedrock of that, the place in which people feel that there is a justification for placing Africa out on the periphery, it lies in that enlightenment vision of of knowledge. And so it was important to address it. And if you address it through that, you then have to look at the kinds of hypocrisies that undermine it. And those are best illustrated by looking particularly at the medieval period, because they, those philosophers would have been aware of many of these things. Yeah, they I had no excuse. They I had no excuse. That. It's so important. Oh, it is. So and I, and I, the origins but if you, of, if you, it was a university. It was Center of Learning, Sankore. Yeah, it, it came before Timbuktu. I know, but if you, if so you, if you read my book or you, or if you watch my series, you'll see that I do, lots of, I I do all manner of different things. <laughs> uh, but, this, but tonight I can only do one thing, and I'm sorry it wasn't the one thing you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I thank you for taking my hat to you, as well as uh, saying that an excellent uh, research and I'm grateful for um, opening my mind as well. So, for fact I say, the uh, the IRS, the episode, has uh, blown me away from Africa. Oh. So, not not the Islamic State, the Islamic is part to say, to embrace ourselves and say, so we are within peace ourselves, not Islam as from the Saudi as part of you. So because that's that's been hijacked. But going going a long time, I mean besides talking centuries ago, thousands of years ago, Islam means like uh, going to, to have uh, instead of um, uh, being uh, praying to one God, I mean to so many gods means to uh, to the um, crafts or artists, you know, the uh, different kind of. Uh, uh, God, which means we came to understand one God, means to, to love ourselves, yes. to appreciate ourselves, not to, to be uh, unhappy with ourselves. And that yeah. way, coming from our, uh, the, 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 to be the part of Africa, what I mean, where the humans or our ancestors really parted from. Yes. And the point I'd like to say is. As you research stated that obviously that we need to really adjust to our African background yes. and for us to integrate to that is to become a peace within ourselves. Yes. To really love the way that we have, we're yes. creative, we're uh, 
sharing our own ideas between the community besides today's technology, yeah. we watch uh, internet, whatever, and it's fun. Yeah. And we don't seem to pay away with uh, other idols of other, especially yeah. the, uh, the uh, it, I mean, it, uh, the, uh, even the Saudis, yeah. so which is, has seemed to be really making a lot of confusions. And I will say also the Islamic is not the way that it's supposed to be, yes. which means what the African, the Africans have yes. given us. I'm part of that African uh, state. Yes. And we, we all are. And, and I, how, what, I, what I was trying to um, what I was trying to give a sense of is that thank you. these these cultures, absolutely at their peak, were when they were the most embracing of the widest spectrum of different of, of different cultures and that they you know they may well have had a single religion at their center but these were liberal liberal people who were driven by the idea of progressing their societies for the benefit as uh, of, of men and that is something which needs to be lauded, particularly today in Africa when there are so many people who would want to see it divided and to see it falling into the hands of religious extremists of, of all flames. And, and I just think that you can sometimes, uh, sorry about this, you can sometimes look backward to find the way forward. And I think that, you know, the example of People like Nancy Musa is, you know, is one that I think um, you know we could, you know, take on board. started Black History Month, that was one of the reasons why I started it, was because if you don't know your history, then you know you, you don't know anything, you're lost. So, very, very inspiring. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. And <laughs>